Hello everyone. Hope you're off to a great day. I should say off to a great day. You're almost finished today, aren't you? It's uh, Wednesday at 7 uh, p.m. And uh, hope you had a great day at work, probably is a better term. But hey, right. I'm so glad to be with you. And uh, as you can see, I'm back in my office. I'm back home and I'm happy to be here. Uh, it was a great trip out east. I had a great time. I uh, had a great visit with my aunt and family. Uh, she's doing much better. I appreciate all those who prayed for her. And they were very appreciative of all your prayers for her as well. And uh, they wanted me to say thank you to you. So thank you for that. I had uh, many meetings with pastors in Newfoundland, uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. I think I meant about nine in total. Last, I think that was about nine anyway. Uh, there was a couple times there was more than one guy there, but at any rate, uh, you'll hear a number of interviews uh, with those guys uh, in the days ahead, podcast very soon, some on the church podcast and later on on our Coast to Coast one. Uh, and I was able to preach in a couple of churches, or one in Newfoundland and then two in Nova Scotia and around Halifax. So it was good. So uh, thankful for faithful ministers and churches uh, on the East Coast. And I ate a lot of fish. It was good. I actually found potato chips that were lobster flavored. I mean, the East Coast takes to the next level on fish and how you eat it. But anyway, take your Bibles and turn over to Luke chapter number 14. Luke chapter 14. And uh, yes, the lobster chips were tasty. Uh, they are all gone at my house now. But anyway, Luke chapter 14. We're going to start there, <clears throat> excuse me, in just a moment. And uh, we're going to look at a number of different uh, scripture portions of scripture this evening. And, uh, you know, as we uh, go through our Christian life, we need to remember that there's uh, forces at work who desire for us to be lazy, for us to give up, or, or even to become useless. And uh, you probably have seen examples of that in, in your life as you journeyed uh, in your Christian walk. You've seen that happen. And uh, we need to strive to do our best for the Lord. Our enemy is not stupid. He's very cunning. Uh, and he's not the dummy that the world would often make him out to be. Actually, he wants to be underestimated. And then he gets the advantage against those he attacks. Satan is an enemy of our Heavenly Father. And thus he is our personal enemy as well. He's an adversary to your family. He's an adversary to the church. Um, there, he, he doesn't want the truth proclaimed. Uh, there's so many things that he's against, and uh, he's against, he, he's active against it. And when I was growing up in uh, uh, in Newfoundland, there, and with my dad, uh, he had a big garage in the back part of the property. And in that large garage, he had this. It seemed like it ginormous workbench. I don't, you know, I wouldn't call it ginormous anymore, but when I was a kid, I thought it was huge. And he had number of big toolboxes in and around that workbench. And uh, there was many well-used tools in those boxes. They in no way looked new. Some of the wrenches were smooth to the touch. They were worn by years of use. Others had nicks on them. There were some there that had burn marks on them from torches. Others were <laughs> looked like they could take a bath for years and still would be filthy. Uh, but they got there were tools that got the job done around our house and on the vehicles that we had. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our enemy has a toolbox as well. And his toolbox has been around since the beginning of time, since he became an adversary. And I'm not going to look at all of them this evening, but we're going to look at some of them that I think that will be a help to us that we can be on guard against. So number one in Luke chapter 14 and verse number 18. Luke 14 and verse number 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. And the first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. So before we go any further, let's pray. Dear Jesus, Lord, I pray you help us uh, to be on the watch for the weapons, the warfare, tools that will be used against us. Lord, help us to stand firm for you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So excuses. In this portion of scripture, 
A number of men give excuses. I didn't read them all, but I read the first one. But they were given excuses why they couldn't follow Jesus at that time. Uh, our enemy is really good at finding us excuses for not serving the Lord. Or maybe not coming to church as we know we should or ought or whatever the case. And I've heard some pretty wild excuses in 20 years of ministry. One of the craziest ones I ever had heard, I might have mentioned this before, but it's still one of the craziest. Back in August of 2000, me and my wife moved to Newfoundland. We just got married in May and we moved back. I became a youth pastor at First Baptist Church and my wife became a school teacher at the school they had. And, uh, you know, my wife, Michelle, was very active with the teen group as well. And we had a lot of teenagers coming out. It was great. And a lot of those teenagers, though, came from homes that would not be considered solid. They were not con solid homes at all. It was some of the situations were very bad. And one guy that came out, his home life was pretty intense, to say the least. And the church was really a source of encouragement for him. The church family in general really reached out to him and, and encouraged him. And uh, this one Sunday, he missed service. Now, sometimes he would miss the morning and come out at night and vice versa. Uh, but it was really rare for him to miss the whole day. That just didn't happen. So the next week, I was out visiting some people, and he was close by where I was visiting. So I uh, knocked on the door thinking he was sick or something. And, I, and he said, uh, you know, I asked him why he missed. We missed you type of thing. Uh, and he said the reason he missed church was because his cat coughed up a hairball. And at first I thought he was joking and I laughed pretty hard, but he wasn't. And uh, I mean, cats do that all the time. It's not unusual. But anyway, uh, I, it was, that was the crazy excuse I had heard for missing a church service. I, I know there's other, you probably heard of some outrageous ones as well, but if we'll be honest, there's times when we all fall victim to excuse or finding excuses. It's a tool of the enemy. We can excuse ourselves from being a good witness or maybe passing a gospel track or leaving a gospel track. Or we can excuse ourselves from serving the Lord as we know we should. We excuse ourselves from sacrificing for the cause of Christ. And we need to really watch out for it. It's a tool he uses against us. So watch out for excuses. Look over in Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter 9, verse number 61. Luke chapter 9, verse number 61. Another also said, Lord, I would follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is referring to procrastination. This is what this is. And again, a number of men said, well, Follow the Lord, but we've got to do other things first. Serving God was good, but these other things came before it. Okay, you know, whatever the situation was. Procrastinating means to put off from day to day, defer to the future, to delay. It's easy to put something off till tomorrow, isn't it? it that's super easy. It kind of falls in line with excuses as well, but it's a little bit different. Uh, and sometimes it's not a sin to or wrong to put something off till tomorrow. Maybe... Uh, I won't go fishing tomorrow, I'll put that off. Or maybe I won't go golfing tomorrow, I'll put that off. Or some kind of fun event. Or maybe it could be even a, a work project. Say, well, no, I need to wait till tomorrow because I need the supplies or whatever the case is. But in the area of responsibility and serving the Lord, doing it right away, doing what needs to be done today is what God wants us to do. Putting it off, that's procrastination when you know you need to do, do it today. If you know a brother and sister in the Lord... Uh, who could use a, a word of encouragement, and you say, no, I'm going to do that tomorrow when you could do it right now and it could be a help. Well, that's procrastinating. Why would you do that? They they need that encouragement today. We should do it. And, and it's very effective. It's a very effective tool of the enemy. Putting it off till tomorrow. Putting it off till tomorrow. And sometimes tomorrow never comes. It's a very popular tool of the enemy in our culture because we are very busy people. And we live really busy lives uh, in our North American society. I think it's uh, the pressure to be busy uh, is part of Satan's tactics on Christians as well. To uh, you keep it busy, moving, 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 and, and you're you know it's hard to hear that still small voice, not not an audible, but the idea of the Lord directing your heart, 
to still your heart, to focus on things. That's really hard when you zoom, 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 and all you hear is a blowing of the horn. I have not, I did not miss the blowing of the horn when I was out east. I didn't hear very often out here, but today I was at a stoplight and three times someone, beep, 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 come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. You know, and, and so we got to watch out for that. We need to, you know, don't put it off. Do what, do right today. Do what you need to do today. If you need to seek forgiveness, seek forgiveness today. Don't procrastinate that. If you need to grant forgiveness, do it today. Don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. Restore that relationship. If you can make a step today, do it. Tell your children you love them. Don't put that off for another day. Do it now. Be an encouragement to another believer. Like, don't fall for, you know, he, the enemy loves to deploy per, uh, procrastination. Make sure you counter that with action. Procrastination is not action. It's putting it off. Action is now. Let's do it. Serve the Lord today. Look over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we see another uh, tool that the enemy uses. It's 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 3. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Divisions is another tool. Paul's confronting some of the believers in the church of Corinth of living in a dishonorable way and causing division among the church. And the word division means the act of dividing or separating. And unfortunately, that still happens today. Divisions still occur. You know, a story's told of a horse in Alberta. One, one horse pulled 9,000, the other pulled 8,000, but to, you would think together they could pull 17,000. You know, you do the maths. Not so. When they work together, they can actually pull 30,000 pounds. The principle is called synergy. By definition, you know, actions of a separate agents together, working together, has a greater total effect than the sum of the individual efforts. More meaning, more can be done in a team effort than that can be accomplished solo. In order for the principle of synergy to work, though, there has to be a team. Just drove out east and uh, went to Newfoundland and things and uh, Nova Scotia. New Brunswick. Uh, I, I can drive a long ways. I love to drive, but you know what? Everybody gets tired, right? So you take a break. If you're by yourself, you take a break. You stop the car and you take a nap or you take a hotel or whatever you're doing. If there's two drivers, well, guess what? When the guy gets a little sleepy, the other person can take over. You can go so much further. Now, so the idea of working to de working together, everything, uh, everything in teamwork it helps go pro propel the team and we're talking about the church and christian work and things propels it forward every person in the local church is valuable and is needed for that team for that church to go forward we're we're, we're a family and together we can build and grow for the lord we all have abilities we all have talents that help the cause of christ uh, I just saw, uh, when, again, when I was out east, uh, certain people playing instruments, and someone was playing a different instrument, and this one was singing. And, you know, just like in our church, we have folks the same way. They have different abilities and different talents. They need to be used. And we can be certain that the enemy loves it when the children of God, when a church is divided. What Paul was speaking about here is what was going on in the people's lives that, you know, in that in church in Corinth, but it happens today as well. Uh, don't envying, strife, and, and division sound like a great church that you want to bring your family to? Absolutely not. It sounds horrible. It doesn't sound like a place that you're going to grow. It doesn't sound like a place that you're going to be able to use your talents. It doesn't sound like a refuge from this world. That wasn't the design of the church, in God's mind, to be a place of division. No, the Almighty wants unity to abound amongst the brethren. He wants them to go forward. So you got to watch out for division. It's definitely a tool of the devil. Look over at Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter number 3. Hebrews, cha or, yes, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number uh, 19. It's a uh, short verse. And it uh, has about something to us uh, that the devil uses, a tool the devil uses. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now that verse is referring to the children of Israel, but unbelief is a tool... The devil, the, the enemy, uses against us. And the word unbelief means disbelief of divine revelation. Weak fee, uh, faith. 
I believe that unbelief is one of the tools that Satan uses against us all the time. Uh, and by us, I mean Christianity, broad sense of the term. We live in a generation that is totally dependent on, like, they exhibit this, I should say, dependence upon themselves. As Christians, we can get so caught up, well, we can do this, and we can do this, and we can take care of that. And, and we really become to rely upon our talents and gifts that God has so graciously given. But we grieve the Lord because we fail to believe. We think we can do it in our own strength. And we display unbelief in God's power and strength. Christians are, around us are falling victim to the sin of unbelief. They hear the stories and things. Uh, they hear that God was powerful. And, and sometimes they think, well, that was in the past. But listen, the God of opening the Red Sea, the Jordan River, the one who knocked down the wall of Jericho, you know, thousands of years later, he hasn't weakened. You know, his power is still all powerful. He owns the entire world, so we can believe he can provide for us. We need to ask in faith, or we need to walk in faith, or whatever the case is. And sadly, we demonstrate a weak faith uh, by looking at our own strengths to carry us through, rather than trusting in the Maker. Now, I'm not talking about doing something foolish or anything, but trust in the Lord to provide. Having stepping up by faith in your own life. Maybe the Lord's moving something in your heart to do something for somebody. Well, follow that. Follow, trust the Lord to take care of you. And see what he'll do. Our God is the God of this universe. He's able. Take uh, over to 1 John. 1 John uh, chapter number 2. 1 John no chapter number 2. And this one is particularly uh, well known for us as Christians. If you've been in a, a church for very long, you've probably heard preaching about it or at least reference to this verse. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Uh, so we need to watch out for worldliness. Uh, you know, we need to watch out for it. And worldliness means covetousness, addictiveness to gain, and temporal enjoyments. Uh, and that is definitely our world temporal enjoyments okay and to gain as believers we should be uh we should be more interested in the things or amusements of this world that we should allow that to seize our hearts and minds and neglect to do what god has called us to do in it and be involved in his work we live in a in a world that has much of those uh flashing lights the things that distract you okay we need to make sure that we are following the lord and we're we're putting distance between ourselves and the world. They're not, we're not buddying up to it. Um, I didn't know this, but if you put a, until recently, uh, if you put a cube of lead and place it on top of a cube of gold, maybe I should rephrase that. I heard this a long time ago. I have just read reread it recently. And I put that tube of gold on top of each other. Eventually, the two cubes will penetrate each other. In the same manner, we tend to absorb... The attitudes, the opinions, the qualities of our closest friends and companions. That's not anything new. That's not something you, you've heard for the first time. So though we, we, we think that we can enrich them with our goal, we need to watch out that the opposite isn't true, that we be, our goal is debased by them. We need to make sure that we have the right kind of friends, not worldly friends. If you know what I'm trying to say, we need to make sure that our friendships, those we have our conversation with, with life, are those that will help us become more godly. Yes, we need to reach out to those who are lost and even be friends and friendly, I should say, to those who are lost and show them a Christian testimony. Uh, but let's make sure that they don't debase who we are for Christ. Uh, Psalmist said, depart from me, evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. All right, let's let's do that in our life. We need to watch out for that worldliness. And in Revelation chapter number three, Revelation chapter number three, the last one is pride. Pride. Uh, verse uh, Revelation chapter three and verse number 15. I know thy works, that thou, neither, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou, thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 
because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest now that, that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The church in Laodicea is being, conf is being confronted on this condition. Uh, we read of their lukewarm attitude. And we see here that they think they have it all together. And the Lord's not impressed with them. He tells them, you're not. You're not those things. You're, you're poor and blind and naked. All right? He sees pride. And pride means uh, inordinate self-esteem, unreasonable conceit or of one's superiority. Or one superiority, I should say. This church was filled with pride. It was seen in every corner of the congregation. And it's pride is something that we need to watch out in our personal lives. We're so quick to think that that we're something, when in reality, according to scriptures, we're nothing but by the grace of God. You know, we're filthy rags, but amazing grace. Praise the Lord for the grace of God. Years ago, when they started personalizing uh, license plates in Illinois, the Department of Motor Vehicle there received over a thousand requests for the license plate one, the idea of number one. And the state official who was job it was to approve requests said, you know, I'm not about to assign it to someone and disappoint uh, over a thousand people. So he came up with a fantastic solution. He assigned number one to himself. <laughs> the idea, I'm number one. I mean, let's just think about our world. Our world is all about me first. I'm, I'm going to be first. I'm going to get ahead of anybody. Uh, whatever it takes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be there. Uh, just yesterday while driving home, I was uh, in eastern Ontario and uh, I'm driving down the highway as per normal and there's a guy on the shoulder of the highway and uh, he was trying to get onto the road, you know, coming off the shoulder to go into the road that I'm on, the lane I'm in and I couldn't go any further over because there's a transport truck, you know, transport trucks and cars together, you can't be in the same space. Uh, so I, I couldn't do anything about it. And uh, so I'm driving the limit that I'm supposed to be living, you know, driving on the road. And uh, the guy on the inside, rather than slowing down, let me pass, he wanted to be first. And rather than slowing down, he gets right next to me. And he's speeding. You know, you're not supposed to be doing 100 on the, on the shoulder. That's highly not recommended. And um, he got upset with me. I, I didn't know what he wanted me to do exactly. And he's... Gave me some nasty hand gestures and things, and uh, he actually never got off the shoulder. He just stayed there, and then he zoomed on by me and stayed in the shoulder and got off at the next exit. I'm like, what was that about? But the idea, he wanted to be in front of me. That, that's what it was. And you might say, well, that's not pride, but the idea, I'm going to get up there. I'm gonna, he could have caused an accident because he didn't like what was happening. I don't know if he understood everything was taking place. Uh, the idea, pride, we get pride in our heart. Pride doesn't look around the circumstances. All about me. What can I do for me? I, I want to get ahead. I, I want this. I want that. Uh, so the reality is we need to watch out for that. Uh, because just like that guy yesterday driving next to me on the shoulder road, maybe he didn't realize there was a truck. Maybe he didn't care. But with pride, you know, that's the way it works. Make sure we have a, you know, a humble spirit and, and to serve the Lord. And the enemy is at work. And um, he doesn't... He doesn't mind hard work. He's working overtime. And these are these tools, and there's others that I have not mentioned, are, are being used. They're being implemented. They're well-worn. There's nicks on them, just like there were in my dad's toolbox when I was a kid. They're, but they work. And that's why they're deployed. And so let's endeavor that we, this week, today, tonight, that we'll make sure we're not falling for excuses. That tool won't be deployed upon us and that we're not procrastinating and that we're not putting off what we need know we need to be doing we do it today and let's make sure that we're we're not involved with any kind of division in our life we're not causing it we're not uh, you know supporting it in, in anybody's life in the church life anything like that and that we're facing uh disbelief we're saying no i'm going to trust the lord and though it's scary and though i don't know what to do and Though it's an uncertain place for me, that we'll have faith in the Lord, and that uh, we're watching out for worldliness. And it doesn't matter your age, okay? We need to watch out for it. It doesn't seep into our life, and then pride, and make sure that that doesn't overwhelm us. So I hope that's been a help to you. Watch out for the tools of the enemy, and he likes to deploy them. All right. So Saturday morning at eight thirty, 
Uh, we'll be having Facebook devotions. Uh, Pastor Matt's going to be taking care of that, Lord willing. So look forward to that on Saturday. And then I hope you can join us on Sunday. The Faithway group's going to be here singing for us. And I know on Sunday, Pastor Matt had mentioned that Pastor McTagg's going to preach, but I told Pastor McTagg, hey, I haven't preached in a number of weeks in my own church. I'm preaching on Sunday, so you got me back, all right? Uh, so uh, we'll be looking at how God led a king, and we're going to look at how God was leading David, maturing him. And so there's some really great principles how God led the future king that we can be applied to our hearts and lives as well. We might not be king, become kings and queens, uh, but can really help us in our spiritual life. And then Sunday night, we'll be examining Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, and uh, just the, the, the conflict that takes place there involving Israel and the Northern Alliance uh, that come up against her. Uh, so if you can't be with us in person, we would love to see you. I would love to see you. It's been too long. I want to see you. Uh, but if you can't, we're online. So you definitely uh, join in with us as well for that. So I hope that's been a help to you. Look forward to the weekend. Be praying for each other. Keep reaching out uh, and uh, pointing others to Christ. Have a great evening. Have a great remainder of the week. And keep looking to Jesus. Bye for now.